Hey guys, welcome to Vegan Booty Talks. And today I have a guest with me. She is an author, podcast host, bikini competitor, and mindset mentor. She specializes in helping people make peace with food, their bodies, and their goals using psychology, personal development, and mindfulness. She was on my podcast before, but now she is back. Welcome, Celeste Reigns, to the show. Hi, girl. Thank How you. are you? Thank you. I'm happy to be back. I appreciate you asking me to come back on. Yeah, we need more talk about mindfulness and spiritual and mental health. I talk about, you know, nutrition and bodybuilding and fitness a lot. And I really feel like people miss information about uh, mindset and, you know, food relationship. This is what we're going to specifically talk about. And I have some, some questions uh, get ready for you. But before we get started, if guys, you didn't listen to the first episode that Celeste was on my podcast, it's actually number 14. And you can go back and listen to that one because that was a cool one. I think a lot of helpful information. But for someone who don't know you at all, could you quickly tell us uh, like, what do you do, where you live right now? And like, how you get to that point. (laughs) Yes. Okay. So um, I'm currently living in Arizona and I moved here for an internship since I'm getting my my master's degree in clinical mental health counseling. And part of that requirement is to complete an internship. So I'm working as a master's level clinician while also running my business, which is what gives me the most joy and pride and has really dictated um, so much of my passion to help competitors as well as the fitness industry to build more than just a body, which is my mission. Um, I have been working for competitors or for the fitness industry serving in this way since 2018. And that was sparked by studying psychology for my bachelor's degree program, going through a lot of struggles myself as a competitor, um, launching my podcast, and then realizing how important this is and how limited it's covered in bodybuilding mainly. And I believe mainly it's because there's not a lot of people who understand how to bridge the gap between mental health and competitors and competitors and mental health. And unfortunately, I think a lot of mental health professionals will tell bodybuilders or athletes that they need to stop their sport in order to have a healthy relationship with food or their body. Um, Whereas I believe that if it's really about relationship with food and it's not about the food itself, then we should be able to pursue our goals while also making peace with ourselves. So in the process, of course. So that's really been my mission. And that's why I've um, focused so intently on that. And um, I'm in prep right now for my 10th show. So I understand the bodybuilding lifestyle and I've had to heal my own relationship with food and my body image. And I've made great strides in my mental health. And now um, I did that through personal development, psychology, mindfulness-based strategies. And I love giving back to the community. Yes, amazing. I love that. Build not just the body. This is what I really agree and trying to build as well with my clients so as on the side of you said it's all going on in competitor world I also want to point that really what's happening right now in the fitness industry is it's happening even when the lifestyle people who come to me and I see they have really dangerous food relationship and you know I think that's also something we have to talk about because of course, when you compete, you go on a specific body mm, fat levels that you're going to look super uh, nice and tone. And then when you reverse, you come back and that's going to be really hard to, you know, accept. But what about those girls uh, that just lose weight and don't really look fat anymore, but in the head, right in the mind, they still didn't accept themselves the way they actually are and still didn't like themselves and hate themselves. Those, all those problems we we're going to cover today. So let's start with my first question that I want to, you know, ask you as this, you know, as a person who specializes in that. So how you actually realize how, you know, when someone have 
you know, food relationship problem? Because maybe some of the listeners have them and don't really realize it. So how you determine when someone is, comes to you that the person really needs help? That's a really good question. Um, a lot of times people don't go out and get help for it until they know that it's a problem for themselves. A lot of times with things like um, relationship with food or disordered eating patterns, I look at it as how it's affecting your life. Not necessarily like these specific criteria that you have to meet that would dictate if you have a disordered eating um, vulnerability or not, but more so how is it impacting your life? So I like to go off of the way that we feel based on how we're eating. So for example, if you're constantly feeling guilty for eating certain things, that's a red flag. If you're always judging yourself for how you're eating, that's a red flag. If you feel like you have to work off or earn food, um, if you're constantly nervous about going out and being around food or going out with friends and being around food, how do you control yourself around certain foods? Those types of anxious, nervous, um, concerned, guilt, shameful feelings are usually what I would start looking out for. Um, a lot of times it is promoted, I think, in not just the, the competing world, as you were saying, but it's a big thing in the, in the lifestyle space, in the fitness industry. We see it promoted all the time. Things like, oh, you need to cut your calories extremely low and starve yourself and you can never enjoy the foods that you like if you want to be successful. Or it's, you can always enjoy the foods you like, but only if you track them to a T. And if you don't, then you're a failure, which then can breed the all or nothing mentality, which is the next red flag I wanted to share. Um, which is basically when uh, you have black or white thinking, like I'm either really perfect or I'm doing terribly, or I'm, I'm losing weight and not enjoying any of the foods that I like, or I'm um, gaining weight and I'm only eating the foods that I like and I can never eat healthy. So those are some of the red flags um, that I could say right off the bat to look out for. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's say someone is listening right now and they're like, oh shit, I actually have that. <laughs> right. It's because like, I think like, 90% of people can have that. Honestly, even I being like nutritionist and health coach sometimes can feel guilty about doing something or eating something or step out from my uh, diet, like, or something like that. So if, for example, someone listen and they're like, oh, I, I actually have those couple of them. So what they should do. Well, I'm assuming this is what they should do before maybe reaching out for health, help, like what they could try on their own. Yeah. Okay. Um, I would start off by identifying like, how do you see yourself? What definitions are you holding yourself to? Because for example, for someone like you, you might say like, I'm a nutrition coach. I'm a trainer. I am an influencer in this space. Therefore I have to represent X, Y, Z things. So you might have particular definitions that go along with the titles you give yourself that then influence how you see your behaviors otherwise. So if someone sees themselves as, um, someone on the diet, let's say they're like, oh, I'm on a diet. And the way that I define being on a diet is being really strict and not allowing myself to go out to eat. Then they go out to eat. Naturally, they're going to feel bad about it. So mm -hmm. the first thing I recommend is see how you identify yourself. What are the labels you've put on yourself and what are the definitions attached to those labels? Because that can start to give us insight into where maybe some shame or guilt or um, worry might be coming from, as well as some insight into what might be beneficial to change moving forward. So when you're setting new goals or when you're looking at your goals, how can we adjust them so that they satisfy how you see yourself, but also other areas of your life? So that's one thing, identity. Um, mm -hmm. The next thing that I would recommend is figure out what exactly is the problem. So if you're afraid of certain foods, write it down, you know, what foods you're afraid of. If you're concerned about gaining weight, write down that that's from like, make a list of all the things that are really challenging for you. Because just by saying it or acknowledging that we have a problem, we're already limiting the impact of that problem on ourselves. Like when we ask for our help, it's proven to reduce the impact of the struggle we're facing. So ask for help or tell someone or write it down so you can see it and, and actually acknowledge that it's happening. Mm -hmm. um, plus that's like your roadmap. So if you're worried about certain foods being in your house, let's say you might start with limited exposure to it. Um, I do recommend doing that with the support of someone. Um, I find that to be important. Um, if you're struggling, like you want to have 
more intuitive eating abilities, but you've never been able to, and you always end up going over and then you feel even worse. If that's the struggle, maybe we start by eating the foods you normally measure and macro track and just not measure them. Still put them in your MyFitnessPal or whatever, but just don't measure them to a T, only for one meal, not jumping straight off the cliff all into intuitive eating for a whole day. Mm -hmm. Um, So those are some, the next bit is like identity first and then writing down what are the actual presenting problems and what's one solution that could potentially help me with it, which if you are like, I don't know, that's why I'm struggling, then yeah, you need to reach out for help, um, which would be the third point is if this is something you're still dealing with, There's tons of free resources out there. I know I have a lot of free resources that you guys can utilize and go through and I'll even provide feedback as you do. Um, But I would say start with the identity and then what's actually the problem and and some ways that you could immediately resolve that. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I think like uh, 50% of dealing with the problem is actually realizing that the problem is exist. That's why it was so interesting to talk about with you, like why and what is actually problem are, because as I said, I truly believe uh, maybe not 90, but 80% and especially females who come to me for nutrition help, they actually have mental health, a problem with food relationship. I want to ask you, what do you think about where those problems actually came from? Like, Mm. you I just I just have a conversation with my uh, uncle and she said to me something like, you know, when one when I was a young, it wasn't even like a thing to worry how much you eat. And it, we didn't talk about dairy is bad. We just enjoy wherever we have on the plate. You are just drinking milk, hanging out around and no one is never like worry about that. So I'm just curious, what do you think about why those problems and nowadays is actually exist? What's happened to the war or what's happened to people that we are start to have this terrible food relationship? I think there's a number of contributing factors to this, um, which can also be identified as risks as well. But one thing's for sure is we're exposed to a lot more promotional material that supports maybe a particular look or rewards it. I mean, you log into any um, social media app right now and they're promoting filters, right? Not not promoting the way that you look naturally. It's like pop up and you can use a filter. Um, so that's, that's one thing I think is dictating how we see ourselves based on how other re- others respond and react to us too. Because mm-hmm. naturally we are community beings. So we seek to fit in or seek to connect and engage. And we want to fit in with certain types of people that maybe we find um, interesting or um, who get rewards or who are celebrated. So when we see someone who's celebrated for looking a certain way, we might think that's how I should be or that's more ideal. So I think the standards have changed. Um, people are promoting very specific looks and um The beauty standard, I think, changes over time naturally, but now it's even more prominent with social media and then people choosing like who they follow. So a lot of times people who want to get in shape will follow people who are in shape according to their standards. So when I say in shape, I mean like whatever their vision is of this. And then they'll consistently judge or um, compare or maybe try to act in this way. And they might model behaviors that are not healthy. And those, sometimes those behaviors outside of um, what we see in media and this type of influence externally, um, it can also stem from internal needs that aren't being met from ourselves as well. And then we turn to food to support those needs. So for example, someone might, um, someone might struggle with the idea of scarcity. Maybe they grew up in a house where they didn't always have food available to them. And so they tend to hoard food or eat all the food on their plate. They constantly finish their food or, or they want to, if someone offers them free food, they take it. Like they might be dealing with something that happened from childhood or the way that they were raised. And that could be influencing the way that they're viewing it now. So Mm -hmm. I think that that could be another contributing factor. And then another thing to consider too, is when we are when we are pursuing a goal of any kind, specifically, like if we're trying to change our body, again, that comes with like things that we believe need to happen. And so if we have in the past had success with, let's say losing weight or gaining weight in a certain way, even if it wasn't a healthy way, it's now been positively reinforced. 
mentally that, oh, this got me the result. So even if it's not the best approach, people will still take it because it was the approach that got them results or that people noticed and said, good job. So positive reinforcements play a role. Um, and then the last thing is th there's like more, like you said, your, I think you said your aunt or your my uncle, aunt. Yeah. Yeah. My yeah aunt. Your, your aunt, um, everyone just ate what they ate. I think too, there's so many more, like when you go grocery shopping, fat free, low fat, sugar free, um, low wow. carb, reduced carb, like these options are put in front of us rather than just accepting that if we had full fat cheese or we had full fat something, it'd probably be more satisfying and satiating to have a whole food than it is to just have something with less and try to eat more of it. So I think the promotion of those types of behaviors or the promotion of those types of eating has changed how people actually do enjoy food. Mm -hmm. um, people won't just put a slab of butter, you know, they might, they might not believe that they should use butter. So they might use like margarine now because it's, it's available and it's been made. So um, I'd say those are some, some important contributing factors. Yeah, absolutely agree with you. Especially the last point is make me absolutely upset as a nutritionist when I go to the store and I see this absolutely doesn't make any sense science like oh my god like sugar being vegan organic uh keto it's just the sugar or something like that and then every sign that you have right there it has plus couple dollars on it mm -hmm. so people <laughs> listen to us please don't believe in those signs first of all read nutrition label if you're looking for a specific thing that you don't want to eat and on the other hand yes just staying with the whole nutrition right because back then they don't have a lot of substitutes they don't have so many processed foods right so i think that's the thing like we are built this crazy relationship with food also by overeating those processed things right that actually make you make you addicted and want to eat more and more and more because like if we look to research it's clear that for example like burgers or cheeses is actually have absolutely addiction. Like you make an addiction if you eat that on a daily basis. So of course you're gonna overeat those and of course you're gonna build the, you know, not healthy relationship with those foods. Like ask anyone, is they wanna eat kale all day long? No, right? Yeah. <laughs> and then the question is why, right? So that's what happened on days and this is terrible. And yeah, we pay so much money for that. That's the thing, right? So as soon as we have a problem, we go to the doctors and then uh, they give us uh, prescriptions. We trying to kill this problem by, you know, some specific pills that actually gonna affect some other stuff in our bodies that actually have to be recovered after. And instead of that, guys, just stop and try to work in this problem by First of all, looking into exactly what you just said, Celeste, why is that happening, right? What's trigger my food relationship? Why I feel bad when I eat specific food? And I want to look a little closer to this, like, um, you know, fitness pal and then counting macros and calories, because it's interesting. Nowadays in the fit fitness industries, people kind of spread out in two different things. Someone is like to count macros, someone is don't like to count macros and want to just follow the nutrition plan. So I want to think, uh, I want to ask you, what do you think about that? Like, what is the best approach as you think? Because some people come to me and they hate to count macros and they think that it's actually pushing them to feel guilty if they didn't log in something or when they stop counting let's say on vacation they couldn't even eat at all and other people say oh this is a mind opening right and i can eat everything and just log in that count and don't feel like i restrict myself so what do you think is the best um well i'm going to backtrack slightly and just say i i don't believe we could demonize or should demonize any food although you're correct that there's definitely addictive properties to eating anything because it, it actually causes chemical changes in our brain when we eat regardless because it, it's a something that's rewarded because it sustains our life 
you're correct though. We shouldn't be just shoving our, our body with anything. And part of a healthy relationship with food, I believe is asking what's going to really nourish me right now. Um, and what's going to be sustainable, which is to answer this question about meal plans or macros Mm -hmm. combination, whatever. Um, I think it's about what someone is able to sustain for a long period of time. So some people that could look like a combination of things, some people, it could look like uh, macro tracking for X amount of time and then having some diet breaks and continuing whatever it is for the person. And, and you could kind of figure out what's sustainable for someone by asking them, you know, what they've tried and maybe it's an extreme diet. Of course, that's not sustainable. Um, maybe it was macro tracking, but where everything had to be zeros across the board every single day, or else it would turn into a binge because if they went over by one, then screw it because everything else is over then. Okay. Now we know macro tracking to all zeros doesn't work, but what if we tried macro tracking with five to 10 grams? Or um, what if we allowed to have um, multiple untracked meals? Like what will work for this person long-term? Cause you know, as a coach, like it's not about how fast you're getting there. It's about the fact that you're getting there and it's healthy and you feel um, supported and fulfilled and empowered in the process because pursuing a goal is so empowering. We get to prove to ourselves that we do what we say we're going to do. We get to prove to ourselves that we're capable of things that maybe we doubted we were capable of, uh, capable of before. So whatever is going to work for you long-term is the best thing that you can do and be willing to have that change with time because circumstances change. Like you said, vacation, health, illness, things like that. So be willing to be flexible and then also be open to suggestions because if you hire a coach who's really trying to support you in getting to your goals, they probably know something that is going to benefit you because they've studied it and they've learned it. And so while you might say, well, it's more sustainable for me to eat like, um, I don't know, cheeseburgers, fries, chips every single day for the rest of my life. If a coach comes in and says, hey, let's try to have a vegetable in every meal, be open to it, Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, you know, because it it could change the way that you perceive fitness or health or your body. So, um, again, I just think it's whatever is going to work for you long term and what's considered of nourishment for your body. Yes, exactly. So it's not the right or wrong approach. For anyone who listens out there and needs help or think that they don't do something right, is not like a thing, right or wrong. And you can just do you, right? What works for you. But at the same time, please check on those things that Celeste mentioned, because sometimes you could do you and you may think you're really healthy eating one apple daily and nothing else, but this is something that in the long term going to kill you. <laughs> so exactly. Honestly, right? Sometimes we think we do healthy things, but if you look on the real picture, you're like, oh no, this is not something really cool. Even though I have results I want to, even though I think I kind of feel fine, this is not good, (laughs) right? Yes. I can ask you like, particularly, what do you like to do? Like, do you feel like you more like macro counting or you like uh, nutrition plans? Um, I'm really, I, I prescribe to circumstantial, like for me, if my, if I'm in improvement season, I like doing more uh, of macro based, but I still always get a plan for my coach. So my coach gives me a nutrition or a meal plan. Right. Mm-hmm. And he has like a swap list. And usually what I do it, like I eat a lot of the same things every single day. Um, the quantities might change or the combinations might change. Um, I like a meal plan because it's structured and I live a busy life. So I can just make what's on my plan and go on. But sometimes I want to add something. I want to um, change it slightly or, oh, I don't have an avocado and I need, I, I can't go to the store right now. So let me replace it with X, Y, Z instead. Like that's the nice thing about the macro tracking that I like. So I take a mixed approach um, in prep. I follow a meal plan, um, but I make macro swaps just like I do an improvement season this is something I found um, is sustainable for me as a competitor in both seasons which is something that I lacked in the past that I think was the cause of some of my struggles so now I have something that's consistent no matter what season and then towards the end of a prep usually around six weeks out I stop making swaps just follow the plan because at that point you usually can't make that many swaps anyway Um, yeah you know yeah, (laughs) yeah your calories are they're lower they're not like extremely low usually but like they're lower, the swaps you're going to make, or it's going to be 
uh, green apple for red apple, you know, it's the same thing. So um, usually six weeks out, I stop making swabs. That gives us more data. But the intention behind it is not because I don't trust myself with the foods that I would previously swap, where I think some people do have that lack of trust. For me, it's about what's the data? How's my body responding? What does my coach need to see? And also, you know, if we're going to be peaking off of these foods, we need to see how does my body respond? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I, I actually did almost the same. I didn't compete for a while now. So I would say I'm more like intuitive eating slash macro counting. Because like being a nutritionist, honestly, guys, I don't count my macros. People think <laughs> I do count. And I do have a scale though in my kitchen still for my competition prep. But for lifestyle, I, I wish I could erase that from my memory <laughs> and mm. don't actually know how much I'm eating. But usually when I look at the plate, uh, and about 90%, I can guess. <laughs> yes. Well, and you're so skilled in your work that <laughs> yeah. you know. Yeah. So sometimes it's actually bad. Sometimes I wish I could raise that from my memory and just relax and chill and eat. But yeah. sometimes I just exactly know if I overeat my macros. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which is cool. Like people like me want it, right? Because I don't need a scale. I can see how much I need to. But, uh, Sometimes it's hard, sometimes really hard. My husband, when we're on vacation, sometimes want to kill me because I not only count this thing on my plate, I also look on his plate and say, oh, you know, add more rice a little bit. You need more carbs today. <laughs> and he's like, can you stop it, please? <laughs> yeah. yeah, so it's like a, one, of, one of the things I'm working on right now. <laughs> you know what helped me with that kind of stuff is... Um, trying to reinforce how food and eating is outside of macros because mm -hmm. we are so conditioned to look at it as macros on a plate and because you calculate other people's stuff too so you're seeing it all the time um is reinforcing like when you sit down to eat not you maybe this will work for you too but um when you look at what you're eating, like, how is it nourishing you outside of macros, outside of that? Like, how does your body feel? What's the experience that you're getting? Like, especially if you're on vacation, like, mm -hmm. okay, maybe what's more important is like the ambiance or um, the way it was plated, like paying attention to how food serves us outside of macros, because I find a lot of people do get fixated on macros to the point where then that's all they think about is food as a number. Um, not again, not you specifically, just in general, people can get fixated on macros and then be like, oh my gosh, like now I'm, I'm way over or, oh, I don't get much food. If I eat, um, like if I'm eating quinoa instead of white rice, now I have to eat less because of the volume. And instead of just being like, what's my body feeling like right now, what would be the most complimentary side to this dish that I'm making, like the protein that I'm eating or the vegetables? Um, what's the experience that I'll have after? Is this going to sustain my energy for the rest of the day? Do I need much energy for the rest of the day? Or can I go with something different? That's not going to be a meat and a more immediate source of fuel. So, mm -hmm. um, like to those of you listening, like change the conversation that you're having about food with yourself. So it's not just have to meet my macros so I can change my physique. It can also be like, I'm meeting my macros because this is what my body needs, or um, I'm choosing these foods for X, Y, Z reasons, like bring a lot of intention to the choices. Yes, absolutely agree with this. This is what uh, I'm working on with my clients all the time too. And looking at the plate and thinking how it's going to benefit me, right? Not only from macros perspective, but from perspective, how do I feel after I eat and how do I feel while I'm eating? Because, you know, yeah. we eat food to enjoy sometimes. It's, it's sometimes yes. we eat food for fun. Sometimes we eat food to... Um, for experience with exactly. the family and friends, right? And that has to happen too. And people forgot about that, especially in the fitness industry. We have this crazy picture of, you know, know how much macros you eat, how much calories you spend and make sure to don't over it. <laughs> yep. This is not life, guys. This is not uh, enjoyable. Much more enjoyable and sustainable is actually nourish yourself. And I have so many examples, even in my per personal career, when I don't count not even proteins or carbs or fats, and I just ate intuitively. My body looked great. I get the best performance in the gym. And then when I start counting, I was like, I don't hit my numbers. Mm. How is that possible? 
right so like I don't not not like I it was bad but I didn't like in my my specific example I didn't hit my protein as normal level that I usually do and I over hit my carbs and then fats was pretty much usually normal uh, on my off season and I was like hmm so actually eating more carbs and less protein doesn't give my body bad it's actually Mm -hmm. did good just an example right so of course it's important to educate yourself. You have to know in order to don't mess up at all. Like eating, you know, some people I know people like that could eat burgers and French fries every day and think they feel good. You know, I know how yeah. they do it, but some people can. So this is not this this example, right? I wasn't yes. eating like that. Again, I was eating something that is fun sometimes, something like not super healthy sometimes, but most of the time, something that's going to give me energy and going to make me feel good. And I want it, you know, because how many times we do things in life that we don't want to do Mm -hmm. and how many times we eat, especially if we have a specific goal, things that we don't want to eat a thousand, a million times. Right. So I just make promise to myself to eat what I want to eat and, you know, feel great about myself because I ate that and I think it's really work because there was my experience and after that I experienced that with a lot of my clients so when we eat specifically and think oh my god this is gonna make me look fat yeah it will it will exactly or if you eat even like cookie and it's absolutely really doesn't have any beneficial uh, super cool macros that's gonna grow muscles but you eating that cookie and you're thinking, oh my God, this cookie tastes amazing. And it's going to go straight in the space that I needed to in my body to grow. Not like they're going to make me fat. Yes. You better going to have this result. Isn't it, Celeste? Well, yeah, because the way that you think about food matters, because it has an impact on our parasympathetic nervous system and it influences like, um, are we going to be in a positive state for digestion or a negative state? And in other words, are we going to be able to shovel all the nutrients from the food we're eating? Or are we going to have a difficult time digesting it, a difficult time using it, um, put our body in a negative state for digestion? And digestion starts before we even eat. You know, it's when we're looking at the food. So you, your mouth is already salivating. Even sometimes talking about it, you can get a little bit of like um, a digestive response. So the same thing happens like when you're thinking about food, be sure to think positive, encouraging, empowering thoughts. So your body's primed for digestion. Um, similarly, you can eat something really nourishing um, to facts-based, you know, research. Um, but if you're super distracted or you're thinking about how much you hate it, or you're in a stressed state of mind, whether that's from work or kids or um, other things going on in your life, it's not going to be as beneficial. And I find that some people will judge themselves harshly for a food that they ate. They'll say, oh, well, um, cookies make me feel, make my body feel bad. And I'm like, cookies or 10 cookies that were eaten in a binge, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Is it that this food doesn't make you feel good on an ongoing basis or that the last time you had it, it didn't make you feel good? Because when you do have the ability to eat more intuitively or think about what your body's experiencing, you'll find that one day, uh, one item of food could make you feel great. And the same item the next day could make you feel less than great. And maybe that's um, a stressor or some other response going on. So yeah, the way you think about food really does matter and, and it changes the experience of it in our body. Yes, exactly. This is like why I love what you do. This is amazing. Like you teach people how to actually, you know, turn your thinking in a positive way. Because I teach people how to actually nourish themselves. Yes. Nutrition perspective. And I spent some time in the mindset space, but I couldn't go too deep because this is a lot of work. So someone listened to us and needs help, or maybe want to just have a consultation with you to find out that um, maybe those symptoms that you described they have is real problem or may not, how they can reach to you? You guys can reach out to me through my website, www.celestial.fit or Instagram at celestial underscore fit. On my website, there is a free food relationship coaching series that's at celestial.fit slash food series. So if you type that into your browser, it'll come up and you can register for that. And it's an eight day series 
it's a it's a bit of psychoeducation and then um, application. So you, I'm not just teaching you things about food relationship, but I'm giving you the tools that you need with a full workbook to apply it. And then I'll provide feedback if you send me your workbook each day. I'll provide feedback to you. Um, I think this is one great way if you want to get a taste for what it's like to work with me or you want to see like the way that I think about things. You could try that out or just reach out to me directly because if this is something you're looking for help with immediately you're like i don't need to do the series i just want to get straight to the meat and potatoes um or the tofu and uh, tofu and potatoes <laughs> um then just go to celestial.fit and we'll be able to connect that way and you can see all the ways to work with me there too yes thank you amazing and your book I personally, guys, did it. I wouldn't say I read it, okay? Because the last book, which is on Amazon, you can go ahead and buy it. It's not really only a book. It's like a journal. You have to write things. And that was a really fun experience for me. And I know you are on the way to build a new one, right? That's one of my goals. Um, I want to complete a new book. After I complete my master's program, I'd like to be able to publish one now with a master's degree. Um, not that you need one to publish a book, because like my first one, I didn't have my um, psych degree either. But it's more so just because of how much work this is. But yeah, the Believe Your Way to Badass is the book you read. And it's a great example, again, of how I like to work. I'm not just about like, teach and then do nothing. It's like, okay, let's integrate what we've talked about or what we've learned into our life. So I'm glad that you enjoyed it. And I appreciate you bringing it up. Yeah, absolutely. Amazing book, guys. Go ahead and buy it. You're not going to regret it, I'm sure, even though you may not have a problem. But this is an amazing book that is going to help you. And imp- like it's, in- it's inspired me to do more and look inside, you know, in my head more, right? Yay. Yeah, it's, it's like so much. It's not food and body as much as it is mentality for life like personal development so if you guys are looking for just like personal development tools that's a really good self-help one to start with yes i agree and then i don't gonna ask i'm not gonna ask the question i usually ask on my podcast the last one because i already asked it to you and you guys i remember the love one yeah and (laughs) you guys go ahead and listen to episode 14 because it's cool one and uh let's answer an usual question right there but i will gonna ask you about your plans and in your career and competition you said you're going to compete soon so tell us about this we all want to know yeah so i took my i took a year off so last competition was december 2020 It took a year to make improvements, put on as much muscle as I could. And now we are in prep mode. Um, We're we're aiming for April, uh, but really the goal is just to see how my body responds over the coming weeks and then let my body dictate when we're going to step on stage. Because the goal is to, well, my goals specifically are to win my class, win an overall, um, and then go back to nationals and compete for my pro card. So that's my current competition goals. And um, yeah, I'm open to the timeline. And then career-wise, I'll finish my master's program in August. And I don't know what I'm going to do with it. Um, If anything, (laughs) I don't know what, I I just want to apply it to my business. That's the whole reason I'm doing it. Um, And I have lots of events I'm speaking at this year. I'm hosting an event in February with um, a team and then, um, um, yeah, I'm speaking at different events and I'll probably host another one towards the end of the year. So yeah, my, my goals are just contribute even more, connect with more people like you and yeah, keep, keep growing and getting the mission out there. So I appreciate you giving me the platform again to come on here and talk with you. Oh, I appreciate you show up. I know it doesn't feel as good right now and I appreciate you find time and energy to do it. I think we have to talk about that more. So we all excited to see more about your goals coming up. And where is the nationals this year? Is in Florida? Um, yes. And I don't know. That one's in um, Florida and that's happening in December. But I don't know which national show I'm going to do yet. Yeah, I'm not going to pressure on you. I'm just curious because it's all messed up. Always changing right now because of this. Yeah. So I'm like, Oh, my, where is that? When is that? <laughs> yeah, there's a few. There's like, um, I, I'm looking at maybe doing USAs again because I do love um, muscle contest shows, mm-hmm. but we'll see. I just got to play it by ear, see how my body's looking. And and if the judges say like, no, you need even more time off, then I'm not going to go and do it. I'll just mm-hmm. take another improvement season and, oh. and bow out. 
Love it. Yes, it's a great, a healthy approach. Thank okay, you. girl, thank you so much again. And then you guys go ahead and sign up for this amazing, uh, you know, free gift that you provide. And then if you need any help, reach out to Celeste. I personally would be happy to because I think she's amazing. And what you do is really help people around the world. Thank you. Thank you. Right back at you. Of course. Feel better, girl. And thank you guys for listening. We're going to hear you soon. Bye-bye. Yeah. Mm-hmm.